So we're continuing this week with our series called New Old. And last week, uh, Jeff, Pastor Jeff, uh, I don't know if you knew he was a pastor, but he is. Uh, Jeff talked about something that that we can easily take for granted, which is the Bible. And he talked about why um, it is not the Bible that we worship, but it's God, uh, the God of the Bible. Um, So so we're, we're taking this time in this series, New Old. The reason we call it that is because we're trying to present some fresh ways of thinking about things that... If you've been around church for any length of time, it'd be easy to think that, oh, I already know about that. And so it's easy to take these things for granted. And taking something for granted means that we think we know what it is, even though we've really just hardly begun to scratch the surface of what it really is. Taking something for granted means that either we treat it with arrogance, as if we have all the answers, and maybe there are important things that we're missing because we're treating this thing with arrogance. That's part of taking it for granted. But taking something for granted also means that we just cast it out altogether because we think it's too difficult for us, so we don't try it. Like the Bible, for example. Some of you may feel like, I've, I don't really understand the Bible. I don't know how to read the Bible. I don't know what this is all about. I don't know. So I'm just going to not do it. I'm just going to not do the Bible thing because I don't get it. That does happen. So that's a big goal for us in this series, is, is it's a warning that we don't miss out on the great and massive and holy gifts that God has for us just because we've fallen into the trap of taking it for granted. We take these gifts for granted. And so we're going to continue in that theme today, and today we're going to be examining the element of worship. What is worship? So this is our series. Sorry, this, uh, I'm still getting used to this uh, system here. So we're start continuing with our series, The Way Things Were Always Meant to Be, New Old. And today we are continuing with the element of worship. Now right off the bat, I want to make it clear that worship is more than just the singing and music portion of our Sunday service. Many of us, if you've been around church in some way, we think of worship as the music part. And I know that for our church, we use terms like the worship team and the worship ministry. And for the most part, we as a church do what we call worship using our voices and our instruments and technology. There are many other ways to worship. But ultimately, the purpose of worship in a church is to draw our attention and our adoration and our awe to a great God. And by doing that, we renew our own souls. So we draw our attention, our adoration, and our awe to this great God. And by doing that, it also does something, there's something in it for us. When we worship God, there's something in it for us. It renews our souls. So to put it even more powerfully, we believe that worship is something that we were created to do. We believe that we are created beings and that we were meant to give our highest honor to the one who created us. I think, if I can give you an illustration, I think that worship is supposed to look something like this. I'm going to show you this and hopefully this works. This is what I think worship is supposed to look like. purest, most innocent form. I mean, look at this. It didn't require any music. There's no music there. It's just, they're just looking at something. They're just in awe of the sight of this fountain. It's a fountain, if you can't see from the corner of the thing. They're just watching this fountain shoot up in the air. Um, I love how they're just enjoying the fountain. They didn't have to, like, try to think about why. And, and sometimes, we, sometimes we can worship by, by dissecting things and taking them apart. But they didn't, they weren't necessarily, like, trying to figure out how it was happening. It was just This is so amazing, and it brought them so much joy. And I also love, especially my son David, this is very much my son David, he is the kind of person that doesn't care about who sees how he reacts to things. Like, if he wants to scream because something makes him excited, he's just going to scream. If he wants to go like this and like, whoa, that's so cool, then he just does it because he is in such awe of what he is looking at. He just can't help it. I think this is so much of what worship is supposed to look like. So yeah, keep that, uh, keep that image in your mind because that's special. The word worship comes from this old English word called worthship, 
and they, you know, they spell it all weird with like these extra E's and stuff like that. But worship is where the word worship comes from. And, and this worship or worship, it's the acknowledgement that something has worth, right, or value. The more you worship something, the more you value that thing. So for, for someone like God who has this infinite worth and value, how much worship are we supposed to give? We give our highest worship, right? And as we're going to see, this worship goes far beyond the singing and the music that we have here on Sunday mornings. It goes far beyond anything that we do just here on Sunday mornings. It goes far beyond anything we do just on this campus. Worship is bigger than that. So today we're going to read from uh, the book of Colossians, chapter 3. And you can go there if you have a Bible or a Bible app on your phone, or you can find a Bible in the front of the seats, um, in the back of the seats uh, that where you're sitting, um, and if you can't find one, just ask somebody, then maybe they can pull theirs out, out of their seat. So I've read this book and this chapter of this book many times, but I saw it in a different way as I prepared for today, talking about worship. So we're going to read Colossians 3, starting with verse 1. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, Why? For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. How about these things? Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, looking at this passage, we, I, what, I, what I noticed is that verse 17 is kind of like a summary of the rest of the passage. The entire passage is about doing it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever we do, whether word or deed, doing it for God's glory to worship. Now, what do I mean by this whole thing is talking about worship? Well, look at, look at verse, this first section, starting with verse 1. It, says, it tells us to set our mind on things above. How many times do we fall short of giving God our highest honor? Not because we have nothing to honor him for but because our minds are set on the things that are right in front of our faces, our problems, our circumstances, our frustrations, our hardships, our failures, instead of on the things above, do you know that this is where worship starts? Because you could say like, well, how can I worship God if I don't really see how how great God is? Yes, and I would say, well, how can you see how great God is unless you give your attention to God so he can show you how great he is, right? Right? We've all done that before, right? We're so distracted, we're doing other things, and we don't even realize, sometimes I do that with my kids, my wife, they're telling me something, I'm talking to me, they're trying, daddy, 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 and they're just telling me something important, right? Daddy, I have to go to the bathroom, right? Daddy, right? And then my son pees his pants, because I wasn't listening to him. And then I have to clean it up. That's what I get for not paying attention to him. We get distracted, that's just, that's just, who we, that's just what we do, we get distracted, right? But it says to set our minds on things above. This is kind of, this is where it starts. This is where worship starts. Set your mind on things above. Well, I don't know how to do that. Well, have you tried? Or have you ever asked, have you ever just stopped? Have you ever just stopped the, the noise? You know, turned off the TV, uh, put the phone down where you can't, where you can't see if the, somebody texts you and the notification shows up on your screen or whatever, just put, like, 
put the distractions away and just stop and say, okay, God, I want to see you. I want to know how great you are. There's so many distractions. Show me. But how often do we even do that? So that's the first part, right? That setting our mind on things above. And we're able to do that, it says, because if we're in Christ, that means we've died to the, the, the one that we were before, the person that we were before, and, and we've been raised again to new life with Christ. See, we can't praise God, we can't worship God if we're not alive, right? What does the psalm say? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Dead things can't praise the Lord, but we pray, we're able to worship God because we have breath. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So he's saying, yeah, do it. Set your mind on things above. That's the first part. Second, when we set our mind on things above, we're able to put to death the things that are killing us, that earthly nature, right? And he lists some of those things, right? So the first list that he gives kind of have to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust. And, and sometimes that's the thing that we think about. We think like, oh, you know, sin just has to do with those kinds of things, the really dirty sins, right? But I'm glad he comes back around and he actually says, no, but it's also what? Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, right? The things that we allow to enter our thoughts. How many times do those things taint us? How many times do we allow those things to take our minds off of Christ? How many times do we allow the angry thoughts that we have towards people, even the people that are closest to us, to take our attention off of God and put them right here? And, and I admit, those things are hard to kill, aren't they? I mean, not only, not only like sexual impurity and stuff like that. Yeah, thank you. This, this carpet is going to trip me up. It's trying to get me. Not only the, the, the sexual, physical, all the stuff that, I mean, those things can be addictions. Those can, things can kill. But how many of you know that we can be addicted to anger? How many of you know that we can be addicted to our, 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 just our natural kind of feelings and emotions and the ways that we deal with things? Those things can be hard to kill, too. Sometimes even harder because it just feels like, hey, I'm a human being. I'm going to get angry, you know, so I'm going to punch things or I'm going to throw things or I'm going to. But we all know it's not good, right? It takes us away from where God wants us to be. But that's also worship. We worship God not only by setting our, our, our eyes and our minds on him, right, setting our sight on him, but we also worship God by daily, daily, listen to me, daily, putting to death those things that kill us. And especially for those of us who have dealt with things like addictions and bad habits, right, codependency, whatever it is, that's not something that just magically, I mean, sometimes it does, it could maybe, and I've heard stories that where people just pray and it goes, but a lot of times it's this, pro this daily process of saying, you know what, it's not me anymore. And you wake up again the next morning and you say, that's not me anymore. And you wake up the next morning again and again you say, that's not me anymore. And you do that as many times during the day as you need to. That's not, that is not me anymore. Putting it to death. Putting it to death. Third, he talks about how we treat each other. He says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Now, I got to say, clothing yourself with all those things starts with how you treat yourself. How many of you treat yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience? How many of you have a hard time being compassionate and gentle and patient with yourself? Me. I do. Okay? So, so the first thing that God's going to do when you do that is he's going to teach you how to do that for yourself. That's why he says love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you don't love yourself, then you're not going to love your neighbor. Or if you're bad at loving yourself, you'll be bad at loving your neighbor. Okay? Learn how to do this for yourself. God's going to teach you how to do this for yourself, but then he also teaches you how to treat each other. We worship by how we treat each other. We worship. Do you, did you ever think about that? That you worship in the way that you love yourself. That is worship. Why? Because you are a created being of, of God. You're a child of God. Do you make mistakes? Do you do things that are, are cringeworthy? Yes. But who are you? Who am I? To be impatient and intolerant and hostile and malicious and, and, and rageful toward myself, a child of God. Love yourself so you can love your neighbor, right? If, if I say that I worship God, but I treat others with arrogance, contempt, resentment, indifference, harshness, impatience, my worship is incomplete. 
This is why for the people of God, there is no room for racism. There's no room for sexism, classism, any other type of ism that puts one type of person above another type of person. There is no room in the family of God for this. There's no room in the kingdom of God for this. This is how we worship. There's this song that I used to sing in college, and it goes like this. It says, the way we live, the way we love one another, the way we give, that's what worship is. The way we share, reaching out to one another, that's what worship is. When we love one another, we are loving the Father, part of his family, we are his sons and daughters. That's also worship, is the way we treat one another and the way we love ourselves. Fourth, he shows us in this section that our lives of worship are more complete when we are involved in each other's worship and allow others to be involved in our worship. In other words, we need to learn from each other. How can we learn from each other about how do you worship? How do you you worship God in this situation, in this area of your life? We have to allow others to be involved in that part of our lives. Look at it. In verse 16, it actually says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. You know what that word admonish means? It's like a correction. It's like a rebuke. It's a strong word. Teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing praises to God with gratitude in your hearts. I mean, yeah, right. Spouses, when you're in the midst of an argument, how many of you would welcome your spouse teaching you or calling you out through through scriptures and songs? Does that ever happen, like ever? (laughs) But we are to be so involved in each other's lives as the family of God that we are able to teach each other in this way and it doesn't have to come across as condescending, as belittling, as like I'm holier than thou, right? Because many many of us have had that experience of, of, you know, this or, or, or this, you know, using the Bible to you know, to, to thump somebody on the head or to tell them why they're, you know, they're bad or whatever. And that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is, is growing in our sense, our understanding of worship by allowing other people to speak into our lives. Do you have people in your life that you allow to not only to encourage you, but to call you out when you need it? Do you have those people in your lives? Are you humble enough to hear those people in your lives? Or do you say, no, 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 leave me alone? And I, know, and, I, and I know this personally because I come from a church background where, where the Bible and scripture and spiritual things were used like, 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 like weapons, like, like to hurt, you know, to, to, to belittle, to, to control, to like, right, to like make you feel like you could never measure up, right? So I know what that's like. I know the, the judgment and the condemnation. I've, I've, I grew up with that. But when I read this scripture, I believe there has to be a way that we as the family of God can be so involved in each other's lives, so, so connected, that when I, when I encourage you, you know I'm encouraging you and I'm not condescending. And, and when I correct, you know that I, I love you. And when you call me out, I know that you love me. There has to be a way, church, for the family of God to be able to do that. And now for some of you, you think, yeah, I just have, I've never seen it. Churches just don't do that well. And you know what? You're right. We don't. Because maybe we don't see it as worship. Maybe we just see it as, I got got to go tell this person right now. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind why they're sinning and why they're going to hell or why they're not doing right or why they shouldn't be part of this church or why they don't belong or why they're... What if I started by being humble, right? I set my mind on the things, on God. And I make sure that I put my own sin to death before I go tell somebody else about their sin, then, as Jesus said, I, I've removed the plank from my own eye so I can actually go to somebody else and say, hey, this is something I want to talk to you about. Maybe if we started there, maybe it wouldn't be so hard to imagine that we as a church could actually be involved with each other in this way. Then we get to verse 17, right? Whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So once we get to verse 17, it's like Paul is saying, okay, I know I gave you this whole list of ways that you can worship and that you must worship in your life, right? Setting your mind on God, putting things to death, treating each other well, right? Being, teaching each other worship by the way that you worship. But if I forgot anything, do it all, all, everything, word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that worship is supposed to be a day-by-day, minute-by-minute way of life? It's not just a religious thing that we do at our services, 
It is a way of life. Did you know that whether you're a Christian, religious or not, did you know that everyone worships something? I mean, just ask yourself, what do you give your highest worth to? There goes your worship. Right? What is it? Money, pleasure, status, entertainment. What is it? That's Everybody worships something. I think we understand that, right? And I think in our heads, we all recognize, we all recognize that as, as Christians, this is what we're supposed to do, right? Whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever we do, we all know in our heads that being a, a Christian, that following Christ, that knowing God, that being filled with the Spirit, that being God's people, it's not just a sometimes thing. It's an everyday, every, all-encompassing thing, right? We know this. But what's, what's the reality? What is the reality that we face? I think in our heads we know that we should be worshiping God in everything, and if it's really true that God is our creator and that we are his creations, that, we, that, that worship should just flow out of us, right? But the reality is that should never did anything for anybody. It never saved anybody. We can't live by should. Should doesn't help because should just makes us feel that God is constantly doing this to us, wagging his finger in our face and never pleased. We need a lot more than should. Why? Because we live in a world where it's not true that good things always happen to good people. Sometimes bad things happen to good people, horrible things, unfair things. That's the reality of the world we live in. We live in a world where nothing is certain and something can go wrong at any time, and often it does. That's the world that we live in. We live in a world where we experience tremendous loss, and all the love and all the prayers and all the good thoughts could not possibly address the pain that we feel. That's the reality of the world that we live in. So in Colossians, we just talked about a lot of Christian theology and practice, Christian living. In the Psalms, we find these lines and lines of imagery, uh, of emotional language from these deep places of joy and pain. We find these things in the Bible, and those things are helpful and encouraging in times of need. But I think one of the simplest and possibly most profound words of worship don't come from these places of long lists of theology and, and long, these lines of, of, of poetry. Some of the most powerful words of worship found in the Bible, which we can hold on to ourselves, for ourselves, are found in these places of the deepest pain or the deepest struggle. In the ancient uh, story of Job, Job is a righteous man who was struck by the devil, literally, as the story goes with one horrible loss after another. And why did this happen? According to the story, it's because the devil wanted to prove to God that Job wasn't really righteous, and that after too many heart-wrenching tragedies and losses, Job would eventually curse God to his face and turn away from him. Job, he said, only worshiped God because God had given him so many blessings. Take those things away, he said, and Job will curse you to your face. Job lost all of his wealth, his health, all of his kids were killed, his wife left him, and in the midst of all of these things happening, in the midst of all of these things happening, Job utters these words of worship. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. These are the words that came out of Job's mouth when he had lost everything except his existence. In a way that we might say it, it kind of goes like this. I came into this world with nothing. I will leave this world with the same. The Lord is the one who gave me everything I had, and it's his right to take it when he pleases. Praise be to God. Now, even though Job's situation was absolutely horrific, and I would never wish that situation on myself, I would never wish it on anyone else. Do you see the beauty and the power in, in these words? Do you see the beauty and the power in these words? He is my God. I am his child. All that I have comes from him. I was made to worship him. And I will do it no matter what. 
So yes, there is the reality of the harshness of life in this world, but there's also the reality of worship, that we were made to worship and that God is worthy of worship, and the reality that we were made to worship him in all situations. And chances are that most of it, and if not all of it, will have to experience, not not all of us are gonna have to experience what Job experienced. In fact, I hope nobody has to experience what Job experienced. This life-changing loss and pain, right? But you experience what you experience. And that's enough to teach us to worship God in all situations. So if you wanna be ready to worship God, even in the midst of that life-changing loss and pain, that's why it needs to become part of our nature. We need to practice daily finding ways and times to worship God no matter what we are going through. And believe me, church, I am saying this as much to myself as I am to you. So in closing, yes, I'm already talking about the closing. I know it's hot in here, but I wanna keep this, I wanna give you some practical things to do so that you can be a worshiper in your own life, all right? I'm gonna give you three sets of three, okay? Three sets of three. Let's keep it simple. First, I wanna talk to you about three reasons why it's important that we learn to live lives of worship. Why, Why must we learn to worship? First of all, because God is worthy. We worship because God is worthy. Notice that we don't worship because everything always goes right. It's easy to say praise God when things go well, right? It's easy to say praise God when we finally get that break. It's easy to say praise God when I finally get the paycheck or when I finally, right? It's easy to do it then, right? But we don't worship God primarily because everything always goes right because many of us will know that a lot of times in life, things can go wrong, sometimes terribly wrong, right? Death and, and, and all those kinds of things, right? But sometimes even in just the daily, right? Like, you know, you wake up in the morning and then you, you know, you're out of milk and you stub your toe and you, know, you don't have any more hair gel so you can't comb your hair or the kids aren't listening to you and then you get in the car and it won't start or you got a flat tire or there's jerks on the freeway or you know, and then you get to work and your boss is yelling at you for something or your coworkers are being, I mean, whatever, you take your pick. The daily just grind of life or the, the worst of the worst? Things will happen. But we worship primarily because God is worthy. We also worship because it takes our attention, our focus off of our problems, and it puts it onto God. No, worshiping does not mean your problems are gonna melt away like that. But in that moment when you worship in the midst of your pain and your struggle, what that does is it causes you to say, hey, there's a God, and that God's bigger than what I'm going through. So that when the problem hits you again in the face, you can say, oh, yeah, there's that problem. Dang it. But thank God there's a God. But thank God he's bigger than those things I'm facing. God, I don't know how we're going to do this, but we're going to get through it. Let's go. We also worship, as I said before, because it's what we were made to do. It's what we were made to do. Trees, through their beauty and their glory, they worship God. They give glory to God. They give glory to God by their splendor and their majesty. They give glory to God by their beauty. They give, God, they give glory to God because they, they help give us life, physical life. Animals, in all of their weirdness, there's some pretty weird animals out there. My son loves to study like reptiles and sharks and things in the deep sea and all these weird animals that are gross and do gross things. Even those things, they glorify God by just their existence, by, by their weirdness, by their complicatedness, by their, just their, they glorify God. We as people, we as creations, we are meant to worship God. And when you're truly hit with that sense of worshiping God, kind of like the video that I showed you, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. That's why we, we encourage you when you, pray, when you worship Raise your hands if, if, that's what, if that's what your soul is crying out to do. Sing out. Who cares who else hears you? Who cares if somebody doesn't like the sound of your voice? God doesn't care. He gave you breath to worship him. He gave you hands to worship him. He gave you feet to go to the places to worship him. To worship him. It's what we were made to do. Next three things I want to show you is the three parts of worship. And there's there's more to worship, I know, but I try to boil it down to what is worship really about, right? Worship is reverence, right? Awe, a deep abiding respect for who God is, reverence. 
There's a, a, a famous worship song writer named Matt Redman. And some of you know who he is. But he, he likes to call this face-down worship, right? Because he, he makes reference to these. In the Bible, anytime you see somebody, there's times where God, where God will show up like as an angel or as like a human being, and people will kind of dismiss him, you know, like uh, uh, Zachariah or Sarah. Then the angel comes and says, like, you're going to have a son. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, right, right? He just laughed in God's face because they didn't realize it was God. Or, or like Gideon, where the angel shows up and he's like, you know, uh, uh, you know, mighty warrior. And he's like, yeah, right, mighty warrior. What are you talking about? He just like scoffs in God's face, right? Because he just showed up as like a regular kind of angel person, right? But in the Bible, when you see people who are faced with like the real glory of God, and it happens a few times, Ezekiel, Daniel, in the book of Revelation, John, they're faced with like the actual glory of God, and they all have the same reaction. You know what it is? They fall down flat on their face when they are faced with the actual real glory, like the full glory of God. They, they, then they're not like, oh no, okay, I hope nobody sees this, this is embarrassing, I'm gonna get on my face now. Like they are so uh, it's like terrified and in awe and reverence of God that they have no, like they, they could no, do no, nothing else other than just fall on their face. Reverence. How often do we have that in our times of worship? Right, or maybe we're just so caught up with like, you know, I got to do something afterwards, or it's like gross and hot in here, or, you know, or I don't like this song, or I don't like the way they play it, or, you know, this song's too loud, or this song's too fast, or the drums are too loud, or whatever. We're focusing on all the other things, and we're singing about this great God. If we were in the presence of God, we would have no choice but to fall flat on our face, as John says, like, like one who's dead. Just like, bonk, right? Face plant right on the floor. Because... Wow, God is completely amazing. And I would say even when you're standing in front of the glory of God, there's this sense of fear, right? It's not a fear. Well, maybe it was a fear that he could kill me. He could kill me, but he's not killing me, and I'm here, and I'm, I'm seeing God like, oh, my God, falling on my face. Reverence, right? Another part of this worship is thanksgiving, that we are, that we are giving thanks to God Right? So there's the awe and the reverence and, and how great God is, but then there's a, there's a part of worship where we recognize that God has done something for me, where God has done something for us, and so we say thank you. This is so important to our lives, church. Thankfulness. We are not thankful enough people, even though we have so much to be thankful for, we are not thankful enough people. I am not a thankful enough person, but God is teaching me to be thankful. This is something that I started doing with my kids, and sometimes we get out of the, out of the habit and we have to get into it again, but before bed... When we go to sleep, okay, everybody say one thing you're thankful for. It's hard sometimes, especially when the two kids have just been fighting. You know, sometimes I'll be like, okay, what are you thankful for? Well, I'm not thankful for, you know, they'll like have to mention the thing that they were just mad about, right? I didn't say, what are you not thankful for? I said, what are you thankful for? Well, I'm thankful that my brother finally stopped doing the thing. No, okay, stop. You're not getting it. <laughs> What are you thankful for? It's hard just to be thankful. Just to be thankful. And that's just for the kids. For me, sometimes it is. It's like I could easily go down the list of things that I'm not thankful for in my head, but what about the things that I am? That's worship too. And then, and then a third part of worship is the response. Now, there's the response of, yes, sometimes it calls for us to raise our hands or sing out or, or, or kneel or fall on our face, or come to the front and pray, or whatever, that never happens here. Some churches, it's like, if you don't go to the front and pray, it's like, you know, you're not really worshiping. But what is the response? But, but the response also goes beyond just, what do we do here in this place? Like, what is God actually calling me to do out of, out of response for this worship? What, what, uh, what, what forgiveness do I need to seek from somebody? Or what forgiveness do I need to give somebody? What relationship do I need to restore? What, what, what justice, what injustice is, in, is there in this world that God is calling me to address? Right? What, what is something that God is going to call me to go out and actually do something about? What, what, uh, what neighbor that I have living near me that, I've been th that God's kind of been telling me periodically, hey, like, you should go talk to that person. Hey, go say hi to that person. Hey, go ask that person what their name is. Hey, just go introduce yourself. And you keep saying, no, no, I don't have time. No, I don't have time. No, I don't have time. Maybe it's going to just simply be that. Maybe, maybe God's not going to call you to go across the world to Africa. Maybe he's just going to call you, call, you, call you to cross your lawn and go talk to that person that's been living next to you and you never even talked to them before. 
Maybe that's going to be the response. But worship always brings a response. Always. If it is true worship, it will bring a response. Always. Did I say always? Always. That's part of worship too. And finally, so how do we make this real? How do we make this real? Incorporate elements of worship throughout your days. You could use that idea that I gave you with your kids or just with yourself. It's a good one. Just get it, buy yourself a cheap notebook at, you know, whatever, 99 cent store or whatever. Write down every day 10 things I'm thankful for. Okay, simple. But do we do it? No. Incorporate worship throughout your daily life. And yes, that could also include playing, playing music that causes you to worship. It could be church music worship, right? That kind of like where they're actually singing about God, and that's great. For me, sometimes it, it's not always just like Christian music that causes me to worship. Sometimes when I hear like just like a shredding guitar solo, like somebody's just really like, wow, that person is an amazing guitarist. Or I hear a drummer that's just like going off and just like they're doing their thing, right? Or I hear somebody's voice is just like, just like singing like, and I'm like, God gave that voice to them. They may not know it, but that music causes me to worship. Did you know that you could even worship God and the music may not even be Christian music? Did you know that? It could happen because God gave that person that ability to do that. When you hear somebody play a piano, whatever it is, and you're like, wow, that is amazing. Worship God in that. You can worship. It can look so many different ways, but incorporate that into your days. Consider how even your attitudes can be worshiped. It's not just the things you outwardly do or say, but sometimes just your attitude. What, what are the thoughts that you allow just to like kind of sit and run around in your head? Thoughts of anger, resentment. Thoughts of, uh, <clears throat> of like, just like hopelessness or failure, right? Thoughts of despair. Thoughts of fear. We just kind of let those things run around in our heads. In your attitudes, we can worship as well. Choosing to have a thankful attitude, choosing to have a hopeful attitude. By the way, hopeful is not just the same as being positive, right? Positive just says, like, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, but we don't really know why. Hopeful actually says, it's going to be okay because my hope is in God. So your attitudes are worship. And three, this is kind of a weird one, but I'm going to explain it. Be here for all the parts of our Sunday service if you can help it at all. Why? For some of you, you come primarily just like for the, I guess for the sermon time, um, maybe for the Bible, because you feel like that's where the real like meat happens. For some of you, you like your favorite part is like the music time. And for some of you, if you like, you, it's not your favorite part, like you just won't come in. Or some people will like show up late for the service because like, well, I can miss the worship time because that's like, that doesn't count. That's kind of just like the, that's kind of just like the setup part. But as long as I'm there for like this part, then I, this whole time is worship. And this whole time is a time for us to worship together. So if we're missing a part of this time, then we are missing a piece of the worship together. The singing is worship. The offering is worship. The announcements are worship. The sermon is worship. The response after the sermon is worship. All of it is worship. So be here, church, to worship together. And if you go to another church, if you're part of another fellowship or congregation, be there to worship together with that congregation. Be there for all of it, because all of it is important. And we do this together so that our souls are renewed, so that we can encourage each other. We all gather together, because then we're going to go out, and we're going to go to the rest of our lives, and we're going to go to the rest of our week, but we're still called to worship. So if you want to think of it this way, think of, it this, think of this as the time where you come, you know, like batteries that need to be recharged or like, a, you know, like something that needs to be like re recharged, like a phone or whatever. This is your time to come, plug in with your family, be recharged, because then you're going to need to go out for the week and, then, and live a life of worship. That's what we're called to do. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. We're going to close. We're going to close by singing this song. This song is a song that comes from the book of Revelation, one of those times when somebody was standing in front of the glory of God, and they're just kind of writing down, John is writing down what did he see in the glory of God. Church, I want to encourage you in this time, respond. Respond in your heart, respond outwardly if you want to stand, if you want to raise your hands.
respond. But most of all, most of all, between you and God, take these moments to enter into what is true worship, that reverence and awe, that thankfulness and gratefulness toward God, and that opening up your heart to say, okay, God, how do I respond to this in my life? So let's do that together, church. Let's stand. If your response right now is you want to just sit and be quiet, then please do that. If you want to kneel, do that. But respond to God out of a heart that wants to worship him.
realize there might be some here who today you've, you've never begun in this, in this <clears throat> relationship of walking with God. Um, or maybe you have, but you've since kind of taken a detour and you need to come back. I want to encourage you right now that you can enter into this life of worship uh, as God's child, as God's son, daughter, as God's creation. I just want to lead you in a time of prayer right now. If that's you, if you need, if you, if you, your heart is saying, I want this, I want this kind of life with God, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for making me. Thank you for making me your child. Thank you for creating me the way that you did. And thank you for making me to worship you. In this moment, I give my life to you. I am yours and you are mine forever. I wanna walk with you and I wanna experience eternal life, not just some far off time in the future when I die and leave this earth, but I wanna experience your eternal life now. I wanna experience life overflowing. I wanna experience life abundant. I wanna experience joy that is unspeakable, hope that is unshakable, peace that is beyond understanding. I wanna experience love that is beyond anything this world has to offer. And I wanna share this with those around me. I wanna be your child, I wanna be your worshiper every day. So Lord, from this moment, teach me. I confess my need for you. I confess my sin that has kept me separate from you. And I confess my desire for all that you are, God. Lord, come and have your great and loving, powerful way in my life. Do with my life what you want, Lord, from this moment. I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now I ask you, if you prayed that prayer with me, whether it was for the first time or you're coming back after a long time, would you just let me know? Would you just let me know so I can pray with you and maybe offer you some assistance as you go forth? For the rest of you, church, respond. Go be worshipers in this world and know that God is with you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. Go in peace. We'll see you soon.